The 10 Biggest Medical Screw-Ups in History Medical professionals are under a great deal of stress. The amount of information they're expected to know, the hectic scheduling and sheer amount of patients, it's no wonder that occasionally mistakes are made. However, that doesn't make it any more comforting to know how tiny errors in paperwork or communication can result in permanent injury or even death. We present you with the 10 biggest medical screw-ups in history, in the hope that it might make you appreciate and communicate with your doctors. Number 1. While at the Washington Medical Center in June of 2000, Donald Church underwent surgery to remove an abdominal tumor. Whilst the operation was a success, there was one slight issue. The surgeons had left a 13-inch or 33-centimeter retractor inside his bowels. In fairness, large cavity surgeries such as the one Church underwent can use between 300 and 600 instruments depending on the duration, so letting one go missing is understandable. Except for the fact that this had happened another four times between 1997 and 2000. In response to the paranoia struck up by the publicity that Church's case generated, Kathleen Selick, executive director of the medical center, promised that instrument counting processes would be updated. The issue with more counting is that the patient is left under anesthesia for longer, increasing potential risk. Don't feel too bad for Church, though. The incident left no long-term damage, and he received a $97,000 settlement for the accident. Number 2. In 1995, a 52-year-old man by the name of Willie King underwent surgery to amputate his leg at the University Community Hospital in Tampa, Florida. He had been suffering from complications from diabetes, with his foot carrying an infection that had begun to spray up his leg. The surgeon, Rolando Sanchez, was halfway through the operation when he and his team realized that they were cutting off the wrong foot. Incorrect paperwork led to the nurse prepping the wrong foot. When Sanchez entered the room, he checked the most obvious documentation and the prep work, and also concluded the wrong foot needed to be cut off. The infection had actually spread to both feet, making it not so obvious which foot needed to be amputated, so Sanchez's conclusions weren't without observation. In addition, he had never actually spoken with King. In court, the hospital paid $900,000 to King, and Sanchez personally paid a further $250,000, despite many surgeons giving testimony that they would have done the same thing given the circumstances. Since the incident, a timeout procedure has been implemented in which the surgeon is required to confirm that they have the correct patient, procedure, and surgical site before commencing the operation. Number 3. In 2006, at Rayleigh General Hospital in West Virginia, Sherman Sizemore, a 76-year-old Baptist priest, had an exploratory laparotomy performed on him to identify the cause of his abdominal pain. However, that slight pain was nothing compared to the first 16 minutes of his surgery. The anesthesiologist, the medical staff responsible for keeping the patient unconscious during surgery, forgot to turn on the inhalational anesthesia, resulting in Sizemore feeling every cut performed by surgeons. Worse yet, they had still remembered to give him paralytic anesthesia, meaning he was unable to scream or move to alert the doctors of the situation. After the team realized their mistake, they turned on the inhalational anesthesia and dosed Sizemore with a drug meant to remove his memory of the event. However, after the surgery, Sizemore's personality changed drastically. He had vague memories of the incident, but the medical staff never told him what happened, leaving him to be unsure of his own thoughts. He became unable to sleep, paranoid that people were trying to bury him alive, and generally depressive. He committed suicide two weeks later, and upon finding out about the mistake, his family sued the hospital and identified the staff at fault. Dr. Bruce Cannon, an anesthesiologist, and Larry Roop, a registered nurse anesthesiologist. The wrongful death lawsuit was settled in 2008 at an undisclosed amount. Number 4. Air embolism occurs when air is directly injected into the bloodstream, effectively causing a blockage akin to that of a clot. And like a clot, these blockages can cause strokes and heart failure, resulting in death. Due to increased awareness of this issue, air embolisms caused by medical professionals are fairly rare. However, between October 6, 1986 and September 17, 1987, an oral surgeon injured 5 out of 11 patients with air embolisms. The specific procedure was the insertion of mandibular dental prostheses, which requires a dentist drill. The issue here is that the dentist drill is hollow, and so in performing the surgery, a mixture of air and water was inadvertently passed into a vein in the mandible and passed through to the right atrium. Three of the patients died from the air embolism due to hypoxemia despite thorough resuscitation attempts, whereas the other two patients suffered from cardiac collapse and subcutaneous emphysema. So, uh, you following along? Eh. Number 5. Benjamin Horton, a 47-year-old Air Force veteran, visited West Los Angeles VA Medical Center to have his left testicle removed since there were fears that cancer cells were beginning to spread through it. 
Whilst this wasn't known for sure, the left testicle was atrophied and painful, so Horton decided to go ahead with the procedure. However, he might not have had he known that the surgeons would mistakenly remove his right testicle. The procedure called for the left testicle to be removed and a vasectomy to be performed on the right side for birth control purposes. This message was somehow confused and Horton's perfectly healthy right testicle was removed instead. The loss of his healthy testicle means a decrease in testosterone production, causing potential complications such as depression, weight gain, and sexual dysfunction. Horton sued the medical center for $200,000, claiming future expenses, i.e. the removal of the other testicle, and damages. This sounds like one of the more reasonable lawsuits on this list. Number 6. When receiving transplants, one of the most important factors in determining compatibility is matching the donor and recipient blood types. In 2003, Jessica Santillan was the victim of what goes wrong when blood types don't match. After receiving a heart and lung transplant at Duke University Hospital in Durham, North Carolina, Santillan went into a coma-like state. Although she had type O blood, the donor had type A blood. Blood type essentially determines which cells your immune system recognizes as self and non-self. Once non-self cells are recognized, such as that contained in the donor heart and lungs, the immune system attacks and destroys them. In an attempt to rectify the mistake, doctors tried a rare secondary transplant with compatible organs, but it was too late and Santillan died from complications. Human error and a lack of compatibility safeguards were blamed for the mistake, with the hospital settling for an undisclosed amount in the following lawsuit. Number 7. In 2014, a scientist working for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, mixed two strains of bird flu accidentally while in a rush to attend a meeting. The two strains, one being safe and the other harmful, had cross-contaminated. Two other labs then ordered the safe bird flu sample, and only upon trialing it in chickens did they realize something was wrong. Even after reporting this to the original CDC lab, the team leader did not report the incident. Only after another lab encountered the same issues was action taken. Luckily, no one was harmed by the accident, but the blunder did show a worrying lack of safety protocol adherence in the CDC, a department generally well respected for their safety. Due to employee privacy rules, the name of the scientist and team leader at fault has not been released. However, it is known that the tests they were performing were completed in just over half the time they are expected to require, implying that the accident occurred due to hastily made mistakes. Number 8. In 2003, Thomas and Nancy Andrews decided to opt for in vitro fertilization to conceive their second child, since they had been having issues. The plan was to use Thomas's sperm to fertilize Nancy's egg. However, when their new baby daughter Jessica was born on October 19, 2004, the couple noticed that Jessica had far darker skin than either of her parents. It was a shock to see that she had African-American features when Andrew was Caucasian and Nancy was Dominican. After three DNA tests, it was proven conclusively that the Park Avenue Fertility Clinic had in fact inseminated Nancy with the wrong sperm. The Andrews sued the clinic, claiming that although they treat Jessica as if she was their own, they had experienced mental distress and emotional heartbreak over the mix-up. Supreme Court Justice Sheila Abdul Salam threw out this aspect of the couple's case, but allowed the malpractice suit against the clinic's owner, Dr. Reginald Puckett, to continue. Number 9. After going through a divorce in 2006, Fischel Descartes decided to do something for himself and get a nose job. However, his motivations weren't purely aesthetic, Takar had been experiencing slight breathing problems and finally wanted to get rid of the minor annoyance. And that's exactly what Dr. Angelo Cusolina did, by removing Takar's nose. Cusolina, president of the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, discovered that Takar's nose was infected whilst performing the nose job operation. He made a decision in the moment to remove the nose, since Takar was already on the operating table anyway. Takar was, understandably, distraught when he woke up to find his nose missing. Whilst Kuzalina was highly respected and had no complaints from previous patients, his record with Takar was far from perfect. Prior to the nose job mentioned above, Takar had undergone eight surgeries on his nose. He specifically requested that cartilage from his ear not be used in the event that there was not enough cartilage in his nose. However, not only did Kuzalina ignore this request, but also took cartilage from his ribs. There are also allegations that Kuzalina prescribed a dangerous dose of medication to Takar, enough to kill him if taken. Maybe Takar should have taken the hint that he clearly wasn't the doctor's favorite person. Number 10. Richard Flagg, a Vietnam War veteran, visited Meadowlands Hospital in Sakakus, New Jersey, to have a small tumor in his left lung removed in September of 2000. However, in the rush of the post-Labor Day morning, the surgeon flipped the CAT scan the wrong way, according to Flagg's attorney, and decided to operate on the right lung. Upon waking from the surgery and inquiring about the tubes protruding from his right side, the doctor told him that he had discovered a ruptured tumour and had, in fact, saved his life. 
This was of course not true, as Flagg discovered when his primary group of doctors filed for bankruptcy. He received a multitude of his own medical records, amongst which was a pathologist report showing no tumour on his right lung. At this point, Flagg had been slowly losing his health and was hooked up to an oxygen tank 24-7. Furthermore, he was told that he could not operate on his left lung, as he had too little breathing capacity. Flagg died in 2003 when the original left lung tumour ruptured. His family sued the hospital, receiving a million dollars in damages. Follow Culture Crush on social media!